Good morning, and welcome to the Metro Vision Idea Exchange, Let's Walk and Roll, Sharing Streets Safely. My name is Kate Hale, and I'm an assistant planner here at the Denver Regional Council of Government, or Dr. Cog. We're joined today by Jay Decker from the Denver Department of Transportation and Infrastructure, Nick Hyman from FC Moves in the city of Fort Collins, and Joe Hengsler from the Old Town Arvada uh, Business Improvement District. Here's our agenda for today. The webinar is being recorded and will be posted to the Dr. Cog website. There will be a brief survey that appears upon exiting the webinar. Please consider taking a minute to respond to that. I have a very short set of announcements and housekeeping items to run through before I turn the mic over to our speakers. Dr. Cog is in the process of developing a regional complete streets toolkit to provide guidance for local governments um, to plan and implement safe, context-sensitive, and inclusive multimodal streets. The comment period just closed and resulted in over 700 comments and 375 questionnaire responses, which are now available for viewing at the website on the screen. We will also drop that link in the chat box now. Uh, stay tuned for a summary of the results to be released in the next few weeks. With the generous support of APA Colorado, 1.5 AICP credits have been approved for attendees listening to this session live only. You can use the event number on the screen to log your credit on the American Planning Association website. By now, I'm sure you're all comfortable with the various webinar tools, but as the interfaces do vary slightly, I wanted to direct your attention to the um, audio settings within the GoToWebinar control panel. If you are experiencing audio issues, you can let us know in the chat box, and Derek on our team will be available to help you troubleshoot. We'll accept questions through the questions pane in the control panel. Um, please submit your questions at any time throughout the event, and we will address them at the end during the Q&A portion. I will now introduce our first speaker. Jay Decker is the Innovation Manager for Denver's Department of Transportation and Infrastructure and PM for the Temporary Recreation Streets or Shared Streets Program. Implemented in just a week, the program has served over half a million residents since rollout and has been universally praised by residents, local politicians, and cities around the world who quickly followed suit with their own programs. Jay, I'm gonna hand off the controls to you now. Perfect. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. Really excited to talk about Denver's Temporary Recreation Streets, or uh, T-Rex program, as we're calling it internally, um, but what is often referred to externally or, or in other cities you may have heard uh, would be kind of familiar with uh, shared streets or even slow streets. So all kind of the same thing we're talking about. We just have a little bit different naming and structure here in Denver. Really kind of just <laughs> taking ourselves back to May uh, of this year, feels like several years ago at this point, um, but we were really experiencing quite a quite a bit of overcrowding in several locations in Denver, uh, really at the height of COVID when we were all scrambling to try to figure this out and, and kind of what it meant and um, safe distances. This was certainly before masks or anything like that. And so really the issue that, that we were facing is uh, you know, we live in the great state of Colorado, and, and especially in Denver, it's it's almost impossible to keep uh, people inside and happy. And so they were uh, really just kind of staying in their communities, but they needed to be outside and recreate. And what we were seeing is uh, really twofold is that uh, almost nowhere in Denver outside of downtown are sidewalks over six feet. And so there wasn't that safe, socially distant space uh, while people were walking or running or 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 uh, biking or, or, you know, pushing strollers or what have you to do that. So people were really kind of actually going into the street uh, in unpredictable areas uh, and in unpredictable ways and, and was seen as a safety issue. And then we were also um, on a lot of our public spaces, you know, people really wanted to be outside. The, the weather was just turning great uh, early summer. And there were quite a lot of parks and, and other areas that just had too much crowding. And so we were uh, really looking at potential ways to you know, actually fix this issue. And we had been focused uh, really on kind of figuring out what an open streets or cyclovia type event would look like in Denver right around this time. And so we had a really good headspace on being able to kind of activate a similar idea to work uh, for COVID reasons. 
as far as the opportunities and challenges of this goes, uh, the opportunities are, you know, exactly what I just talked about. You're really providing that additional space, uh, relief pressure in areas that have overcrowding. Uh, but then also, you know, just just give extra, uh, to, you know, recreation space in those areas that they didn't really have access to parks either. Uh, as far as the challenges, this is this is the short list. Um, anyone, you know, working in the transportation sector is very familiar with a lot of these issues and, you know, really needing to work through them. Uh, it was really interesting at the time of, of COVID back then that, you know, a lot of these were known, but weren't quite known in the sense of what kind of that everyone locked down at home would be. And so we kind of had to make some guesses and assumptions on some of these things. And um, safe to say that's worked uh, pretty well so far. Uh, I'd like to go in real quick, just a methodology here to kind of let you know, uh, ultimately, you know, what our data driven analysis was and what led us to pick the exact locations that we did. Uh, really, the first step started with uh, just kind of playing around with GIS here. And so we wanted to look at two kind of distinct areas uh, that we noticed were areas of need. And, and first one was park deserts, individuals that, you know, really didn't have that five minute walk to a park to even enjoy that great outdoor space in a socially distant manner. And then also uh, areas adjacent to parks where uh, there really was just way too much crowding and we needed to provide basically extra kind of surface area for people to actually congregate safely. What we did first, uh, and you can see it here really well, is we just kind of did a five minute buffer around all of our parks and parkways in Denver. Uh, we're very lucky uh, in the in the city that we do have quite a lot of access. But as you can see, there there isn't universal coverage by any means. And, and so there are still uh, quite a bit of areas that, that do need help in that regard. And because we couldn't, you know, plug every hole here, so to speak, uh, we really overlaid two different types of data on top of this. First one was looking at uh, uh, residential population density. Everyone was staying at home during this time period. And so we, you know, felt pretty safe just looking at residential density. And as you can see, some of the gaps here uh, where there's darker colors were uh, really, really in need of, of additional park space. The second one, and, and uh, has been very important for Dottie for a while and continues to do so, is we really wanted to look at our areas of need. Uh, and so it's not necessarily always where people live. Oftentimes that overlaps with more affluent areas, which is certainly not where we want to direct all of our resources and time and attention to. And so we looked at those park desert gaps and then also how it relates to our uh, internal equity mapping and, and really focusing on areas of need. And as you can see, there's some overlap, uh, but certainly there's, there's some areas uh, that have quite a bit of need and, and aren't quite as residentially dense as others. Uh, this is just kind of a quick sneak peek at our thought processes around some of the parks uh, that were receiving the most overcrowding in Denver, and then a look at some of the streets adjacent to them where we could actually feasibly uh, turn them into kind of these shared streets and open up that additional surface area. Once we had figured out the general areas that we wanted to create these uh, recreation streets in, we really need to figure out which streets uh, do we actually turn these into? And so we were able to do that from a variety of criteria to make our lives easier. Uh, first and foremost, uh, primarily on local streets. Uh, any streets, you know, collectors or arterials have a lot of safety issues and then certainly um, traffic uh, impacts as well if we were to close those down. Uh, at the time, you know, we really wanted to avoid commercial areas uh, because those uh, were receiving a lot of kind of deliveries and takeout and things like that. And we didn't want to impact that at all. Uh, I think, you know, if we were to redo it at this point, you know, you, I could definitely see a need on potentially focusing on those areas specifically to drive uh, through uh, some of our economics and supporting our businesses. But at the time, the thinking was a little bit different there. Uh, and then also, you know, just flat out could not be in, in, on any uh, bus transit routes because we couldn't impact the bus service. And then uh, really important to note here is that for these streets that we did select, uh, some of them do cross some of the busier uh, collectors or arterials in Denver. And so we wanted to make sure the alignment where they do cross was done at a signalized intersection. And so it was a much safer crossing than if it would be unsignalized. Uh, as far as, you know, once we figured out the specific streets, you know, we had a whole laundry list of, of candidates here and uh, a limited amount of resources at the time. 
And so we needed to figure out, you know, what were uh, our priorities. And really, we looked at a kind of a scenario that blended some of the residential density um, and some of those areas in need through our equity uh, and ultimately kind of came out with the results. Uh, what you can see on the right here is the map of ultimately phase one through four that was implemented. This is a little bit of an older map, and so some of them have uh, been changed slightly. Uh, but really, you can see that, you know, primarily they're kind of focused a little bit in the downtown area, um, but we did try to do a, a, an okay job of spreading them out. Um, so it wasn't just clustered around where um, the highest density was. And, you know, really just kind of a, a quick sneak peek here on kind of some of the distances and the devices we were looking at and some of the costs. And you can even see, you know, on that far right, estimated cost for 30 days. This program was really intended just to be up for 30 days and we're going on, gosh, what, six plus months at this point. So uh, really kind of goes to show that um, even the best laid plans, you know, sometimes they go a lot longer than we need to. Once we uh, figure out the locations, we, we handed it over to design. Um, so this process, I've, I've been really impressed with our engineers. This took them about a day to really dig into those uh, 11 locations, figure out what would work and what not work, um, and, and really kind of push it out in a safe manner, but also in a quick manner. Um, one of the things uh, that was really key for them is is embracing those lower traffic volumes that we did see at that point and certainly we we are continuing to still see to some effect now um, and not necessarily having to have all of the typical precautions that you would do on on a normal street that maybe would have that higher traffic volume because it didn't at the time once these locations were designed so we uh, work with our implementation team to get them out there you can kind of see uh, that is uh, 11th uh, over on the right photo really what we had at our disposal was to use type 3 barricades uh, those are traditionally just used for construction uh, but that was the best method we that we had at the time to go ahead and put them out and they've been decently successful in that uh, we actually did not have any of these barricades uh, at the city i think we had maybe like 10 of them total so we had to use our uh, contracting mechanism but different cities may have different uh, devices available and then uh, to really get it done and and uh, you know on the ground as soon as possible as you heard earlier it took about a week uh, we repurposed a lot of our staff to install signage uh, to really kind of go out there and put some of these things up and, and to assess them and change them in the field uh, as needed after the kind of the first bit of learning experience. And then also we kind of worked on a phase rollout. Uh, you saw on the previous slide, we had phase one through four. So that lot, uh, allowed our engineers a little bit more time to, to figure out and tweak things as we learned and, and put them on the ground. As far as communication, uh, you know, I, I am a planner, and so uh, typically we are very robust with our community outreach and engagement. For this, uh, it was very much not the typical case. Uh, we were at the height of COVID. Uh, all information that was coming out of Denver was coming through our joint information committee out of the mayor's office. They were very tight-lipped on a few things because they wanted just a steady stream of very important key information during that very scary time. And so we were not able to do any sort of uh, public gatherings, community engagement, flyering, uh, surveying, really anything like that. And, and so it really just boiled down to signage. And then also just a, a real kind of brief press blurb that was put out uh, a few times to get to media. But I think it's safe to say that a primary uh, primary amount of folks uh, that experience these streets, at least from the beginning, they learn from them, from just seeing them and looking at the signage. Um, we ended up going with uh, the blue informative signage from MUTCD to let them know, uh, very big, bold signage that we put on every type three barricade, just kind of alerting people that these were shared streets, uh, the modes that you need to look out for and how you needed to go much lower. And then also at the time, you know, we didn't have any masks or anything like that. And so really just letting people know that um, no gathering uh, was allowed on these streets. They really are for just kind of recreation and being outside. And then also, of course, to kind of keep that six foot safe distance. Uh, the other sign that's not listed on here, um, one we didn't create ourselves, but we had our contractor put on is the uh, the typical like no through access sign. And so really alerting folks that, um, you know, very typical to maybe if a construction project was on your street 
that you are allowed to drive on them if you live uh, on that street or you need to get through to that street for a delivery or, or for any other reasons. Uh, but if you were just commuting through to, to choose a different street because we were uh, diverting traffic and, and more so giving priorities over um, bicyclists and pedestrians in that street than typical. One of the, the interesting things that we learned uh, after the fact and, and continues to be something that we discuss and, and perfect over time is that these type threes, uh, they're, they're very temporary and removable, which is great for quick action, uh, but that means that average person can move them. And so we've had a, quite a lot of reports on you know people pushing them out of the way, people completely uh, taking them out of the street, um, hiding them, or even on the other side, taking them out of um, one of our um, shared streets and actually putting them on the street in front of their house because they wanted to make their own shared street. So really went both ways as far as people moving them, both kind of pro and against, which is really interesting, but you know, kind of boils down to just, just maintenance on our end. And so at the beginning, we had to have these checked daily uh, four times a day just to make sure they were in a safe place. And then that they were um, actually working as intended and as function to maintain safety on that. Um, I'm, I'm glad to say that over time, people have become a little bit more comfortable with them and, and the movement of the devices has decreased. Uh, but it really just does depend on the location. Some of the tighter streets or some of the more uh, densely packed streets as far as residential population and use, they get moved more so than some of the other streets. And so it really just kind of depends on the character of the street and how often maintenance that they have, which is really interesting. And uh, ultimately kind of what resulted here is uh, on the left would be just Dottie's uh, work. So we were, we were able to get about seven and a half miles out there. That would be center lane miles. Uh, but we also worked closely with our parks department, uh, gave them some of our barricades and then make sure some of the streets that they selected uh, worked well uh, with our streets. And so they almost became kind of a, a, a network of how you can get into the park. And then when you're in the park, recreate safely uh, without the fear of vehicles in that park. And then also kind of getting you out and back to your home. Um, so the, you know, really I, I like to think of them together here. So we're looking at over 18 miles in total, although kind of two different shared environments, but they did work well. And then uh, one of the great things uh, that we've been able to do on these streets is, is put down a lot of our tube counters. Uh, and so we've gotten you know, months and months of data on many of these locations. Uh, and we're starting to see kind of some of the results on that and feel a little bit more comfortable uh, discussing them. And, and really what we're seeing now is uh, the, the usage has gone down certainly in the winter, but it's still maintaining its high level. But during the summer months, it was certainly the highest in the first five months, you know, we had over half a million, and, and frankly, that's a very conservative estimate because we weren't counting on all of the streets. Um, we were probably uh, seeing over 10,000 people a day use these during the height. Uh, the summer was just fantastic and, and really outpaces really any other infrastructure, even dedicated trails like the, the Cherry Creek Trail or the Platte River Trail in Denver showing, you know, <laughs> if you know, quote unquote, if you build it, they will come and if it is a safe environment. And, and the data, most importantly here, which I'm really excited to talk about, shows that, you know, vehicle traffic, um, it was down significantly, um, over two thirds of the traffic, which was one of the main points that we wanted to do here. So number one, diversion, uh, we would mark that as success. Um, number two, vehicle speeds of the vehicles that may, stayed on these roads, um, mostly people that live in that area, um, they actually did lower their speed by quite a bit. Um, we were seeing kind of on average about a third uh, reduction in speed, which is great. So we've got both diversion uh, and speed reductions. And then, you know, from a bike ped standpoint, I know a lot of planners and, and advocates on here uh, have been harping this for a while, but if you build a safe and a high comfort environment, you're naturally going to get people that want to gravitate towards it. And so we saw a tremendous increase in the walking and rolling group uh, versus kind of our baseline averages here. Um, this is an average. And so some of these locations had upwards of 12, 1200% uh, 1, increase, which is just absolutely insane. Um, and some were a little bit lower. And so, um, but you can see, you know, as an average, um, definitely up and definitely up quite a bit. And then also, you know, just a final point here, the mean speed uh, is down to uh, below 15 miles an hour, which is a very safe speed um, to have comfort and safety. Um, so it really kind of just shows that 
Um, designing these uh, in a way that works well uh, really just actually leads to, to fantastic results overall. And oh, sorry. And the final slide we have here is that, uh, you know, happy to say we are not resting on our laurels right now. Uh, we do have commitments to keep uh, this program up through COVID, although that's not technically public. Um, so that's uh, keep that one private a little bit for now. And the way that we're doing that is we're looking at redesigning them, really kind of looking at what the 2.0 design would be. As you can see on the left, those type three barricades, um, they're very sad and they don't work very well during the snow weather. Uh, and so we are looking at more uh, adaptive or kind of uh, hardened designs, so to speak, uh, water filled Jersey barriers, potentially uh, really using some of our neighborhood bikeway elements, mini traffic circles, curb extensions, things like that to really have the same effect, but not be something that someone could go out there and move and, and return to an unsafe condition in 30 seconds. Uh, and that also would work for um, fire access and uh, snow plowing and some of those other traditional street uses that we still need to work with um, that uh, a big uh, orange barrier down the middle sometimes has issues with. Uh, and so with that, I will close and just say that, uh, you know, please feel free to reach out if you do have any questions or would like support on doing something similar in your community or would like to collaborate if you're already doing something similar on how to take it to the next level, we're all actively working on this and uh, happy to participate and, and collaborate and make it uh, more successful on our end, but then in other communities as well. Great, thank you so much, Jay. Uh, next up to speak, we welcome Nick Hyman. Nick is a program specialist in the Active Modes program with the city of Fort Collins. He has managed large-scale community events focused on sustainable transportation and community development, specifically open streets and bike-to-work day events, as well as involvement in planning and implementing Fort Collins Bicycle Master Plan. Um, just a reminder, if you have any questions for Jay's presentation, Nick, or throughout the program, um, feel free to pop them in the uh, chat box now. Nick, I'll hand off the controls to you. Great, thanks, Kate. Um, it's really nice to be here uh, to be able to, to talk with so many people from um, our wonderful state. Uh, and thanks, Jay, for, for setting up, I think, what, uh, at least in Fort Collins, has been um, a really important precedent. Uh, we, have, we have really looked to Denver for a lot of uh, solutions to, to get different ideas about how we can evolve our Open Streets event, uh, particularly in, in the time of COVID. Um, Certainly, I think as many of us are familiar with uh, early in the spring as COVID really started to ramp up, we started to hear concerns about um, is it safe to, to recreate outside? Uh, we were certainly trying to, to encourage people to, to be outside rather than, rather than inside. Um, and Fort Collins is, is home to, to almost 30, 30 plus miles of multi-use trails plus hundreds and hundreds of miles of um, walkable and bikeable streets. Um, and, and kind of with that in mind, we were setting ourselves up to implement a, an open streets event similar to what we've been doing since 2014. But these questions about the virus and um, the, the uncertainty around the virus and, and what science was, was going to be telling us really decided uh, as a city to put a hold on, on our open streets event. I think that the benefit that comes out of that, uh, the silver lining that I'm seeing in a lot of different program uh, programs that, that we develop, but also are across the state and across the country as well, is that um, we've we've been able to adapt our programs in a way that we never thought possible. We're talking about ideas with open streets now and moving into our 2021 program that are, are things that were maybe only pipe dreams to begin with, or maybe even ideas that we didn't have to, to start with. So I think that at the end of the day, uh, there's some optimism to be had about what our, our programs can ultimately look like. Um, I want to talk a little bit about today about where we've been. I think that there's a lot of history with Fort Collins Open Streets program, what happened this year, and then ultimately a bit about where we're going. Um, so in, in Fort Collins, our Open Streets events um, highlight new routes every year. And in fact, we have yet to duplicate a route. We've hosted 11 events since 2014. And we've taken some minor adaptations. We've looked at using uh, our, our new and existing bikeways uh, and, uh, and highlighting those facilities with activation through open streets. We've also tended to focus predominantly in the north part of our city, 
Um, we see a lot of opportunities for engaging uh, the south part of Fort Collins, uh, especially as we see a, kind of a latent demand for, for active modes of transportation in the, in the southern part of the city. We've also experimented a little bit with some smaller events. So the photo that you see on this particular slide is from uh, an event that we co-collaborated with uh, Larimer County's Built Environment Program. This was in 2017 called uh, Fiesta de Movimiento de Hickory Street. Um, this, I think, was our first really good example of co-creating an event uh, similar to Open Streets. It was only maybe two, uh, maybe only a, a quarter to a third mile in, in length, but it was hyper localized and really kind of opened the door for what we can be doing on a community level. And I'll talk a little bit more about that too. Um, so we left off in a really great spot with Open Streets. It was our sixth year. We've been engaging uh, per, per year, uh, upwards of 130 vendors um, per year, usually more than or around 100 volunteers. Our average participation is looking something like 7,000 community members. And we're definitely seeing uh, more youth, more family participation. And something I'm really proud of is in inclusion and incorporation of arts and culture into our, our Open Streets program. Um, the graph here is showing uh, the participation of each of our events. Uh, the, the blue is usually our first event. In the case of 2014, it was our only event the, uh, that year. The black bars are showing uh, participation from our second events. So there you can see we're, try, we're generally trending upwards. And in some cases, um, our events are, are uh, pulling about 7% of our total population which uh, is comparable to some other major cities that we, we tend to, to um, have, I guess, some friendly rivalries with, uh, particularly Portland, Oregon. They tend to see about five to 7% of their total population engaging in their open streets events as well. Um, the, our open streets program is rooted in our 2008 and our 2014 bicycle master plan rec recommendations. And as I mentioned, uh, we kicked off in, in 2014 with our very first event. Uh, some of the, the highlights for Open Streets, I think, in, include things like food trucks and Northern Colorado music. We've been really intentional about engaging visual arts, including the photo that you see here, which was called the Make More Art Battle. So this was happening in the middle of, of the street during one of our Open Streets events. Um, and each of these artists was tasked with painting three, three works of art over the course of the day, and then the participants at Open Streets actually voted on which, which ones were their favorites. Um, we really stress free participation and free activities. We are really looking towards uh, interactive and educational type of activities. And then the piece that I think, I, uh, that I think is, is uh, the, the most exciting is how we've been able to drop our per event cost from about $24,000 down to, in most cases, less than $10,000 at this point. And that's, that's uh, gross expenses that doesn't take into account sponsorships and other things that we've been able to, to secure. Um, so $10,000 for one of these events, I think, is, um, is pretty excellent. Uh, I think it opens up a lot of different possibilities um, for communities of different sizes. Um, of course, on the surface, our Open Streets events are, are all about engaging in activities and, and culture and arts, but of course, um, for those of you that are familiar with open streets programs, it's all about active transportation. We select corridors that we consider to be walkable and bikeable on a daily basis. As you can see in these pictures, uh, bicycling and walking are, are definitely two of the most predominant ways that people interact and engage in open streets events. But I think it's important to, in my opinion, to keep these as relatively hidden components of, our, of the design. Yes, we're all about promoting active transportation, but we operate on this underlying program theory that mere exposure to active modes in a safe, comfortable, and easy to access environment may, li may likely lead to a future modal choice shift. So that's really the idea here. We look at, um, of course, building infrastructure and educating our community members on how to properly use the infrastructure. Um, but activation is where our Open Streets program really fits into it. We've taken some changes to our, our marketing program too. So the, the image that you're seeing on this slide is our current, um, our current marketing suite. Uh, it's hard to see here, but right next to Open Streets, you can see the tagline, Ride the Route. We made that modification after year three. In my opinion, time is of the essence with these events. I've seen that in our case, three years is what it took to mature the event. Um, and after that, it seemed like things were uh, participation, community recognition, 
uh, vendor willingness to participate, volunteer willingness to participate, all that sort of took off after, after uh, year three. And also in addition to that is when we kind of changed some of our, our marketing. So ride the route. We were really trying to encourage people to think of this as a bicycling event rather than our former uh, tagline, which was come play in the street. Um, I think there's a lot, to, a lot to say about that concept. It certainly harkens back to, to other parts of uh, uh, in our history where uh, playing in the street has, has either been a norm or less of a safety concern. Um, and yet we still kind of hear some concerns from our community members about that too. Um, so 2020 came and one thing that I, I'm really happy that we did was, was take the opportunity to really dig into some contingency planning. So these are just basically for reference, but this was our uh, kind of ranked order for our, our contingencies uh, with our first event, our first would be event, which would have been uh, late in late May. Our first thought was, okay, well, maybe we can still pull this thing off. Let's implement a status quo open streets event. I think we've done a pretty good job of duplicating, uh, replicating the same type of event, which was successful to a degree. Um, so that's kind of where, where our minds were going. Let's duplicate the same thing. Um, but as more information about the virus was starting to, uh, to be made public, as, as, as scientists really started to understand more about how the virus uh, was spreading, we, we also realized we needed to take some things uh, into account if we were going to be pulling off one of these events. Uh, so we first started kind of in order, you can think about these as, as more minor uh, contingencies uh, up to spreading out to, to more uh, contingencies that have a larger impact on the overall feel of the event. Um, so we thought about increasing spacing between vendors. We thought about modifying or limiting or even excluding some types of, of activities uh, particularly activities with shared equipment, shared sporting equipment, or, or anything else like that. Um, finally, we thought, or, or next, we thought maybe we should just consider reducing or eliminating vendors altogether. We can still host a closure. We can still connect it to parks and schools and other neighborhood amenities. We'll just do without the vendors. And then the fifth, uh, the fifth option, which is really where I want to spend the rest of our time talking about, is decentralizing the event. Um, we talked quite a bit about um, about trying to implement things that we were seeing like Denver's T-Rex programs, um, but thought that maybe we just didn't have the, the political sway, uh, the, the buy-in from the community to really make something like this a reality. So decentralizing the event was, was kind of where we began to focus. The photo that you see here is our, our, of our mayor, Wade Troxel, and this particular event is from July 4th, which is what I'm going to talk about next. So Open streets uh, was essentially scrapped. We thought we can't we can't make this happen. Um, we had secured uh, a couple sponsors, most likely, or a, a couple of sponsors. The largest of which was an internal program, our our municipal broadband program. Um, so that made shifting that money around a bit easier. Um, but it, it it just became apparent that we couldn't implement open streets the way we thought. Um, I was ready to to kind of close it up and say let's. Let's keep planning and thinking about what we can do over the course of the next, you know, of the next uh, couple. What can we do in 2021? What can we do beyond that? Um, but to, I think, the benefit of our community, um, our typical July 4th planning team, which includes uh, folks from our neighborhood services, community development and neighborhood services program, as well as our special events program, um, pulled some of us together and said, hey, we're canceling our July 4th uh, program. Generally, it's, you know, tens of thousands of people in City Park listening to the Fort Collins Symphony, watching fireworks. And, and of course, we just didn't feel like that was a, a prudent something that we a prudent decision, something that we could do in good conscience at all. Um, so we relied on what neighborhood services has been cultivating over the last several years, which is our sustainable neighborhoods program. We've got about five neighborhoods in Fort Collins. Our neighborhoods are much less defined than neighborhoods you'll find in Denver. Um, but nevertheless, they are generally comprised of uh, HOAs or uh, other neighborhood associations. And, and about five of them are involved in our Sustainable Neighborhoods Program. Um, these are neighborhood neighbors that are already interested in sustainability on a broad picture, that are already relatively engaged in city processes. Um, so we leveraged them. We also coordinated some other things uh, through, that planning, through that planning team, including a hot air, hot air balloon launch the morning of, uh, we had a, a flyover 
uh, scheduled as well. And then we really focused on there's these things that you can look up from your from your front porch and watch, you know, and, and participate in. What else can we do that's focused on people's wh where people are? So we had this idea of uh, coordinating front porch barbecues where you move your grill out to the front to your front porch making food for yourself, but allowing you, you to connect with your neighbors, uh, the social develop or social capital development piece is something, of course, that is incredibly important in times like this. Um, driveway chalking, I didn't include uh, our our Garfield. We missed Pride this year. So actually our Garfield was in was in drag for July 4th. Um, it's, it, was, it was super fun to be able to, to do something like this and celebrate within our uh, within our, our neighborhood. The other part that I, that really tied in the, the transportation piece was uh, this these music trucks. So we thought, why don't we coordinate um, a route with music funded from a local nonprofit um, and bring music to people? So we created two simultaneous routes. Um, these music trucks or trucks that had a, a band on them each, each had a band on them, drove around the city around a prescribed route, stopping in places that we thought uh, would be accessible to a majority of people by either walk, walking or bicycling that were in their neighborhoods, uh, again, bringing the activity, the music to them. The music trucks played about five songs and then they departed, um, but it was it apparently uh, garnered a lot of attention uh, from, from the neighborhoods that they were, they were stopping in. A couple of photos um, from July 4th as well. And then the the second opportunity came up, which which was on September 29th. This would have been our second Open Streets event. And again, we thought we maybe had an opportunity around July 4th. We thought, let's wait and see how how the rest of July goes, how August goes, and then maybe we can think about planning a, a, a typical Open Streets event in September. Well, that isn't the way things happened. Um, instead, though, and I think again to the benefit of our community. We were able to leverage what we learned during the 4th of July and replicate that for a new event that was kind of a riff on Neighborhood Night Out. We pushed it uh, ahead by a week from the, the, the official Neighborhood Night Out schedule. Um, we built on July 4th and open streets. Um, we integrated uh, active modes of transportation into the marketing components. Uh, and again, we oriented activities on music um, and, and other things that, that the neighborhood could participate in, in parks, in neighborhood centers, in places where people already were. So trying again to bring the activities to people where they were, uh, especially so that people didn't one have to have to go too far. But I think from a from a transportation perspective, trying to to get people to show that you can do things um, without necessarily leaving your neighborhood. Uh, just a couple of photos. Uh, we had um, some. Folks, this is uh, a staff member from Neighborhood Services uh, making buttons. This was a typewriter poet in our city park and at another one of our community parks, Lee Martinez, we had the Rocky Mountain uh, Raptor program. Again, I wanted to bring up the underlying program theory that exposure to active modes of transportation in a safe, comfortable, an easy to access environment leads to future modal choice shift. At least that's the theory that we operate on. And to keeping those in mind, along with the, the lessons learned uh, with our July 4th and September 29th events this year, plus looking to some of our peers, such as Denver, for things that they're doing in this space, um, I think that we're setting ourselves up for what I hope is um, kind of like a, a leapfrog of, of our event, an evolution of our event to become something that's much more strategic. Um, continuing to focus on highlighting new infrastructure uh, and highlighting the, the assets that are inherent to our neighborhoods. Of course, continuing to emphasize active transportation and smaller scale events, continue to use uh, evaluation to refine our events. But I think what is, is perhaps more important is to look at uh, decentralizing not just the work that I do, but the work, uh, what this program really looks like. So including other special events and staff who have experience in uh, in other events that aren't just open streets or transportation related events. Um, strategic outreach and engagement. Um, this is, to me, I think that the, the the concept of 2020 is equity and how do we how do we have equitable service delivery from a municipal standpoint? And that is certainly includes events like our open streets events. So 
uh, engaging in more strategic outreach, neighborhood level engagement. Um, ultimately, we'd like to have neighbors picking the routes, which has long been a, a dream of ours, rather than the city saying, this is where Open Streets was, is going to be. We'd prefer to have the neighbors say, this is where we want Open Streets to be. Um, and I think the final point here is, is looking at ideas of longer duration, more, more opportunity to pilot infrastructure, um, like diversion, like protected intersections, more protected bike lanes and different, uh, different variations of those types of facilities, ultimately with the intention to inform some of our more permanent design changes as we work to build our, our 20 or build to our, our low stress uh, walk, walking and bicycling network. A little bit of contact information here. Um, please note my phone number is actually 416, uh, but that's that's the only mistake I made there. Anyways, thank you very much. I look forward to your questions a little bit later on. Thank you, Nick. Um, love Garfield and Drag. Would love to see a picture of that. Um, last but certainly not least is Joe Hengsler, Executive Director of the Old Town Arva Arvada Business Improvement District. Joe has been with Old Town Arvada Bid since 2017, where he has acted as a tireless advocate for downtowns and building strong community. Thank you for being here today, Joe. Take it away. Awesome. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, Jay, Nick, um, it's always great to see what other communities are doing. And I mean, you guys are obviously doing a fantastic job. So um, here we go. Let's see. I have control. Oh, perfect. Um, so we kind of had a different lens when it came to um, the Old Town Street activations, and we'll get into that here. Um, you know, just kind of stepping back a little bit. Um, you know, when we were in shutdown in May and we knew that we were going to be opening in June, um, we did want to provide that safe um, kind of atmosphere and environment for people to come back out after they were in the shutdown orders. We wanted people to be able to, um, you know, social distance and all of those good things. But we also had on our mind, like, what can we do for our small businesses here in Old Town, Arvada to help them recover? And so um, at the time, you know, there was a lot of talk among downtowns. We were going to need to be able to um, increase capacity, give people room. We knew restaurants were um, under the gun as far as having their limited capacity. So we started to think about closing down our streets or opening them up to pedestrians um, as far as that goes. Um, so at the very, very beginning, and it's always fun to kind of look back here because who knew we'd be here this long, um, we were very, very fortunate in Arvada. We have great community partners. We have a ton of organizations and we all kind of like each other and work really well together. And so pretty much just from the get go, um, Arvada started the Arvada Resiliency Task Force. And that was members of the Arvada Chamber of Commerce, um, Arvada Economic Development Authority, uh, our association, uh, the Visitor Center, um, you know, Community First Foundation, which is a great nonprofit partner, and of course, the city of Arvada. And so through that, we were meeting pretty much oh, bi-weekly in the beginning to develop plans, to respond to health orders as they were constantly changing, communicating with our businesses, seeing what level of support they needed. And, and really just from the get-go, we hit the ground running, making plans and um, you know, kind of building the plane while we were trying to fly it all at the same time. As we started to move towards June and it looked like we were going to open up, um, we began to get additional kind of business input on what support they would need as they opened up. If there was a desire to have expanded outdoor patios, for instance, for our restaurants, move a little bit of retail outside and how we could really activate our space. Um, of course, you know, the Old Town Bed, we're a small organization. Um, we, we have two staff members, myself included. Um, and so our resources and our bandwidth were a little bit limited. Um, so obviously we were going to also depend on the support of our uh, partner organizations. And so our next step as we were kind of pursuing this was we wanted to get everybody um, it together around a virtual roundtable. And so we hosted a series of roundtable discussions with different industries and different sectors, um, retail, restaurants, kind of the fitness industry. Um, and when we did that, we thought it was important too for our city officials to be able to hear directly from our businesses. 
And so um, they were gracious enough to join us, um, you know, city council members, um, our mayor, Mark Williams was on there, um, members of the city manager's office, all kind of came to the table and were very solution oriented. And I think the mantra kind of became, how do we get to saying yes about some of these things that um, maybe police weren't necessarily comfortable with or, you know, um, our traffic engineer department. And so that was just, you know, this really great example of, of being able to innovatively problem solve. So um, after, you know, we had these round tables and they, they heard from everybody and there was this really big desire to, you know, move towards closing our streets and, and doing some of these activations. Um, we then went back out to everybody in the business community and circulated petitions and let them know what we were trying to plan um, and, and getting their buy-in, uh, which I thought was just immensely important. And then, um, you know, we developed some maps and we started proposing ideas on how we would actually do this. Um, for those of you who've been to Old Town Arvada, you know it's not a huge downtown. I mean, we're about 16 square blocks and, and really uh, we have two super activated um, you know, streets, which would be Old Wadsworth and Grandview Avenue. And so as we were looking at kind of proposing ideas in mass, like this is what I would have loved to have proposed. Uh, this is a rendering that was done of our Old Town Square and Old Wadsworth Boulevard. And you can see the food trucks and the, the tables and all of that. And it's a, it's a beautiful rendering. And um, we were moving pretty quickly. So this is what I actually proposed to the city at the time. I Google mapped it, I drew some shapes, I made some notes, and it was an ugly proposal. Um, but once again, we were lucky we had the existing relationships in place and they were able to see this and come down and walk the area with us and look at different problem areas we might have. Um, and creatively problem solve. And so I always kind of like to stress this, this part of it where, you know, you can have the most beautiful drawing, but at the end of the day, um, it was really just kind of having the ideas and getting them in front of the right people that really got us moving here with this plan. So as we began to look at how we were going to do this and how we were going to do it quickly to benefit our businesses, we really looked at what we could do to activate quickly um and you know i think as jay mentioned um you know their initial plan was for 30 days our initial plan was for about two and a half months and so as we were kind of trying to you know deploy this quickly um bistro tables and chairs um putting up the holiday lights early um, looking at doing some patio extensions, um, you know, some some additional signage and wayfinding as far as encouraging people to be safe and wear a mask and social distance. And really, we, we leaned on our businesses to activate. And so a huge part of this for us was um, our restaurants and our breweries and how we could support them, because we know that that's a huge draw for Old Town. And so when we were looking at the patio extensions, our approach was to say, okay, we can secure the funding for the patio extensions. And we were lucky enough that um, the city came to the table and shared some CARES funding with the bid, um, along with a bunch of other organizations. And we were able to source some patio extensions. Um, by the time that we got the okay to do this, we were looking at about a two week turnaround time, which was incredibly short. Um, and we were lucky we actually reached out to a local manufacturer who came up with the concept and gave us a, a steal of a deal because they also were big um you know advocates for community and they created these great patio extensions um after that that we we really left it up to the businesses to say like hey you know we can do this part for you but you know, we need you guys to get creative on seating and other amenities. And so in that bottom picture there, this was one of my favorite ones. Um, you can see a place called the Arvada Tavern. It's a great um, cocktail bar. And what they did was they actually built out a kind of a, a deck in addition to the sidewalk to have all one level there. And so that was kind of some of the innovations we began to see. Um, 
Over here, you see um, another place called So Radish. They, they did the light up water cubes to kind of add some um, additional vibrancy. There's the deck once again, and you can see all of the kind of bistro furniture that we added. Just to, you know, once again, it was safety. How do we encourage people to come down, um, give them a reason to come down, but also let them be safe. And so having that additional outdoor seating um, definitely added that as we kind of move through the process and continue to add to this and, and add different vibrancy, we were also very fortunate to work with the city and Old Town Arvada became an open container um, area. And so people were then able to, you know, grab a drink and wait for their table to open since, you know, they were limited in capacity. And it really just, you know, created another reason to come down to the district. So some of our results that we had um, achieved out of this, um, you know, we were able to expand outdoor dining for 20 restaurants. We saw a 78% increase in sales tax from May when we were shut down to June once the streets opened. Um, you know, it led the way for us to be able to start to imagine some new public art initiatives and some new place making initiatives. And it really now has led this kind of discussion around, hey, do street closures become a permanent feature of Old Town? Um, before the pandemic, I think we were talking about piloting possibly a single block to see if it would work for us. Um, once everything hit, we really looked to say, let's shut down as much as we possibly can, um, keeping you know considerations of traffic flow in mind and some of those things, but we wanted to provide as many businesses with the benefits of having that activation in front of them as possible. So even the businesses that aren't in the street closures were able to take over some sidewalk space, um, do some you know additional furniture out that way. And so that's been fantastic. And what we've seen is um, the community really support this. We issued a survey, oh, about a month and a half ago. And what we saw was over 90% of the um, responses, um, you know, marked that they either loved the street closures or they liked it. Um, we had close to 90% of participants say they wanted street closures to be a permanent feature of Old Town. And so now we know that we're going to, you know, keep close through March. But after that, I think there there'll be some serious discussions about, you know, how we can do this um, and, and see, you know, if, if we can just kind of continue this on. So um, I think, yeah, that's about it. I think we can go to the question part now. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Joe. Um, yeah, we have reached the question portion. Um, we have a few that have already come in um, that we'll start with, but please continue to submit questions through the questions pane. And if we do run short on time, we'll do our best to provide follow-up to um, all the questions you receive. Um, we had several questions about this, so I'm going to start off this portion by focusing on the issue, uh, issue of equity, how to ensure that shared streets are accessible to all communities. And also there was a question about uh, whether you received any pushback from vulnerable populations who might have felt that this was uh, pushed upon their neighborhood. I guess I can start here with um, with Fort Collins and our Open Streets program. Um, yeah, so I mentioned that equity, I think, is 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 becoming or is kind of the topic of of 2020, and I hope that we continue some momentum here. Um, We've done in Larimer County a pretty robust analysis that we call the multimodal index, which is uh, it layers health equity data with an, a GIS analysis um, at the census tract level, basically giving a score to a census tract or a census block based on their access to non-motorized transportation. What we typically see is most of those areas are on the, the north and particularly the northeast part of, of our community. Uh, of course, there's some other places as well. Um, I think that that's the biggest shift that I really would like to see with our Open Streets program. Um, I mentioned during the presentation that we've we've largely said as a city, okay, well, here's where we think we should implement these events. We think that there's generally are some historically marginalized and typically under-resourced communities that we could have an impact on. Um, but with our with our large scale events, I think we've generally missed the mark on that. Admittedly, um, currently we're working on. 
um, uh, an engagement activity around our climate action plan update, as well as uh, a component that has some travel demand management potential. Um, what we're trying to do is, is engage um, Latinx community members in our community to help them co-create a, a marketing element to, to that TDM element. And then ultimately, uh, we hope that that can serve as, as a model for, for moving forward uh, as we continue to, uh, to evolve our, our Open Streets program. Um, as far as pushback goes, um, yeah, I mean, we, we generally field a handful of calls from, from community members. Largely, I would say that they tend to be people who um, are concerned about access on, on a Sunday. That's the day we typically host, host our events, so access to, to work or to, um, to church or, or just general access in general. That's never a concern with us, but nevertheless, it's still something that we continue to bring up. Um, from from more of our historically marginalized community community members, um, no, I don't say we've I, I can't say we've generally had some push pushback with the one small scale event, the Fiesta de Movimiento to Hickory Street that we coordinated with Larimer County. The intention there was to help was to have that community co-create the activity. So that community, based on input from community champions who were also uh, who are also you know mining that information from the community itself. Um, they helped to, to de determine who was going to be there, what vendors were we going to have at the event. Among those vendors, what were what their activities look like? So that it wasn't something that was missing the mark or almost tone deaf from a cultural perspective. Which, again, admittedly, I think that that's maybe a possibility with some of our with our our, our flagship program because of the way that we've been doing things. Now, I guess my final point here is that I think that. I think that we can have an influence, and I think that we can improve our historically marginalized neighbors um, through some of this programming, provided that we bring them to the table first and foremost. And I think that that is, is my one nugget of uh, advice, is to bring them to the table first, often, and then figure out a way to continue to keep them involved with something that's actionable, that has, um, that has potential outcomes that they can really feel connected to. Uh, and I will say on, on the Denver side, our, you know, Nick outlined it really well. The difference between ours is, is <laughs> ours is like a COVID response and it's not programmed in, in any way possible deliberately. So there's a little bit less like prescription and, and invitations of people to come into it. Um, but one of the biggest, you know, equity takeaways that we've received is that uh, we did a fairly good job of, of locating uh, a lot of these resources in some of our more equity focused neighborhoods. Um, but what we've seen through actual usage is that it's actually much lower in these communities. Um, and we had expected that because these communities are naturally uh, less dense and so less people to use them. Um, but I think it was even lower than what we expected. And after having outreach with the community and kind of discussed it, it was basically a boiled down to the lack of communication and outreach that was across the board for all of them, but in more of the affluent neighborhoods that are more used to receiving, you know, attention and programs like this, they were able to figure it out on their own through the signage and what it meant. And in some of those other neighborhoods that I referenced, they just thought it was construction activities because, you know, it looked like construction barricades. Uh, and so I, you know, don't fault them for that. I think that, that really just kind of shows the point of what equity means. It's not equality. It's not equivalence. It's not giving everyone the same thing. It's paying extra time and attention to these neighborhoods um, be, for a variety of reasons to actually get them to participate and understand that it is for them. Um, you know, our, our pushback really came from um, what we heard initially, and this was just us kind of monitoring um, the social media feeds, um, some of the Arvada groups and things like that. We were hearing from people who had concerns around mobility issues. Um, and, you know, how were they going to get to their favorite business if they had to go so far, you know? And we, we did take that into consideration and, and we continue to. Um, you know, we, we did make sure that within the closure, um, we installed extra ramps for ADA accessibility. But then on top of that, um, there were certain businesses where we left the street open so you could pull through and then get into their parking lot still so you would still have that ability. And like I said, um, the city continues to be innovative in addressing these um, issues. 
um, beginning on Friday, we're actually going to introduce a ballet program in Old Town, Arvada as well. Great, thank you all. Um, the next question is for Nick. Um, Nick, what changed to drop the um, cost per event, i.e. how did you save that money? Um, That's so, a great so, question. Um, it was really interesting because I mean, we had, like I mentioned in the presentation, we had um, upwards of like $40,000 dedicated per year for these events. Um, it wasn't necessarily an issue to secure that amount of funding. What became more apparent to me was that there, there were a lot of efficiencies that we could find. Um, I think that it really boiled down to our marketing mix and doing robust evaluation on our marketing mix. Um, you know, some of the some of the most costly elements to that, such as vertical banners like vinyl banners that you would see hanging from streetlights. Um, we thought that would be a great idea. I'm I'm all about experimenting as long as we can evaluate and determine whether or not moving forward that's that's something we want to pursue. And with things like like vertical banners, we were shelling out five thousand dollars or something like that. And based on on our analysis of of participant data, they were generating like less than half of a percent of of people that when people were asked the question, how did you hear about the event? less than half of a percent were saying by vertical banners. So it was like, okay, well, that's not getting us the reach the reach that we want. That reach isn't tr translating into participation. So maybe let's forego this. And in fact, we have found that our um, 11 by 17, you know, paper posters, we can print and distribute a hundred of those for about 200 bucks. Um, social media for us, you know, $500 might as well be $5,000 in terms of marketing budget because it really is that potent of a mix to our, to, or channel to our marketing mix. Um, there were other elements as well. We always rented um, porta potties and picnic tables and umbrellas and other amenities that we really hoped would create uh, a sense of, of a place, uh, of create a, a reason for people to want to mingle and hang out in the street. And we also realized that not all of those are necessarily important, um, you know, consistently throughout our entire event route. So we could save a little bit there. Um, and then the third part is, is offsetting some of our expenditures through sponsorships, which to be honest, um, could require a lot more work than I think we're, we're currently seeing. At this point, it's been, it's been lucky that there are participant, past participants who have connections to business that then reach out. I mean, it's like an email that I'll get that people are like, hey, I want to throw a couple thousand bucks at this and, and sponsor. Um, we've learned from in, internally from our recreation department and others um, some best practices. And, and we've, you know, we even have a, a sponsorship and a vendor package that we, that we send out to. Um, so the sponsors are, are fairly nominal, I guess, in the grand scheme of things. They certainly help. And I think that there's more energy that can be put into that. Um, but the marketing piece, I think, to button that up nicely is, is really where we saw a, a majority of our savings. Okay, and this question is um, for all. Um, how do you manage expectations around these projects of stakeholders and the public in a period of so much uncertainty? Any lessons learned or best practices? Um, I guess I'll jump in here right away. <clears throat> um, to me, it, it's communication. Communicate, communicate, communicate. Um, talk to, you know, when, we're not hearing so much from businesses about who, you know, about a desire to want to, to have these events like open streets and bike to work days, things that are generally, I mean, when we look at that in combination, our bike to work day and open streets events may engage anywhere from a total of 20 to 30, 35,000 people on an annual basis. I think that people, my theory, I guess, or my hypothesis is that People have so much else going on in their lives right now that especially from a business owner perspective, um, I don't think it's that important. So I think for them to be engaged in other things when they're worried about how they're gonna pay, how they're gonna pay staff, how they're gonna pay rent, you know, all of these other bigger, you know, bigger issues rather than if they're going to, you know, expand their potential reach through a public event. So 
Um, I think that communicating with people like what our intentions are, even if they're even if they're murky and 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 not baked, I think that seems to be helpful. And then at the same point in time, not pushing when we when when someone doesn't get back to us this year, it, to me it's kind of like you know I bet you they've got a lot of other things going on. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna harp on this issue, and instead use that extra time to figure out how we can continue to make evolutions to our program so that when we get out of this we have a robust programmatic suite that we have tested that we've poked holes in that we've read that we've re refined and redefined in an effort to have an intention of better engagement and better outreach uh moving forward um i'll just second what nick said it, it is all about communication and it's communication through multiple channels um you know, we, we put out our e-blasts to our business community. We have a merchant's Facebook group that we're communicating with. Um, it's not uncommon that we just go out and walk the district and go to the business owners themselves because right now, you know, we're still in a point where everybody's kind of um, facing a lot of uncertainty and, you know, the problems are just kind of stacking up right now. And so we, we want to make sure that, of course, we're managing expectations, but that we're also hearing them um and, and to that point i think it's always helpful um which i would do in any situation is to kind of under promise and then over deliver for them and then that way you know i think that really helps with the kind of like okay thank gosh that came through and you know what it's better than i thought it was going to be um, i was a little nervous that like you know it wasn't going to turn out as great so yeah it, it's really that communication piece especially when it comes to opportunities um, that they need to be taking advantage of, new grants or marketing initiatives and things along that line. Uh, yeah, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll wrap it up and just say, you know, I think the two gentlemen before me really hit it. You know, it's all about communication and working well. Uh, in our instance, you know, we had to move without communicating. <laughs> so we didn't really take a lot in. and. Um, we have had to fix issues and um, communicate and fix uh, some miscommunication or some miseducation things. And so that really just shows that communication up front, when you are allowed to do it, uh, is how you should do it and will ease problems in the long run. You know, I just well, want to add think, one other thing. Oh, go for it, Nick. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to add one other thing on the topic of expectation. I think that there's another way I'm kind of interpreting this question, which is the expectation of how do you participate in something like this. And I've seen this from with our, you know, with our past open streets iterations, where our taglines, like I, like I mentioned, come play in the street versus ride the route, um, how we kind of build the event. Um, I, I think that that expectation of how people are to participate is also really important to consider when you're developing a program like this. You know, we saw people come out who are like, well, this, you know, this mile and a half length of street is way too big. And of course, they were walking, you know, with a stroller. And it's like, that's great. Let's set the expectation, though, that you don't have to, one, participate in the entire route. You can visit one of our five activity hubs and get basically the experience that you're looking for or engage in it in, with a, a transportation mode like a bicycle or a scooter or rollerblades or something that really allows you to cover that territory. Um, my point here is that the expectation of how to participate, um, I have found requires so much more additional um, effort on our end as staff to show people what that is, to, to show pictures, to describe it, to put out videos of what it is so that you give people an idea of what it is. Um, at the risk of sounding callous, which isn't my intention, I have found that people have a have a difficult time um, figuring out how to be creative without direction of how to be creative. So when you give them a blank canvas and say, do whatever you want, you're not going to get the same type of, of outcome as if you were to say, OK, here's your blank canvas and we've got a lot of a lot of opportunities. But let's start by this and I'm going to show you step by step how to get there until we get you to a point where we can kind of let you let you free. Um, this question came in for Joe, but um, sorry, this question came in for Nick. Um, what have you learned that will inform permanent design changes? Um, is there any focus now on these permanent design changes? Um, this is this has been a pipe dream with Open Streets, I think, more or less. Where you know, I had ideas. I had a big map printed out that hung behind my desk a, a couple years ago, where. 
I was starting to you know, draw on it all of these different demonstration projects that I wanted to include, um, borrowing a lot of concepts from tactical urbanism. I wanted to have you know, uh, mini traffic circles that were, were uh, made out of, and I forget what they're called, but they're stuffed with hay. There's actually like a word for these, used in construction sometimes to prevent uh, to filter, help filter out things going into, into drains or something. Anyways, I wanted to do that. I wanted to do protected bike lanes. I wanted to experiment with buffers and so on and so forth. And I realized that, um, at that point in time, it was, I don't want to say a one man show because I certainly had, I certainly had some assistance, but, um, it wasn't nearly the breadth of, of people involved in open streets, uh, in the past that we're starting to see the potential now. Um, so, yeah, that was a like that was an expectation I had to manage, you know, for myself. I think moving forward, where the potential lies is for us to say, okay, according to our bike plan, here are these corridors that we've made some progress on that we maybe haven't made some progress on. Um, here's the corridors where uh, a bike pet facility is going to be complicated. We're done with the low hanging fruit, basically, in Fort Collins in terms of, of our, our low stress bike pet facility um, infrastructure construction. At this point in time, it's going to involve um, conversations about um, impacts to parking or um, you know thoroughfares, uh, kind of like Denver has been experimenting with these diverge, diverters. I mean, I would really like to to, to think about ways that we can try this with the expectation in the community that this is only for a week or maybe two weeks. This isn't going to necessarily dictate what the ultimate corridor looks like, but instead we're gonna, we're gonna engage with the community. We're gonna talk to you at Open Streets and after to figure out how did this work? Where are the problems? What else do we really need to think about before we implement these permanent changes so that we get it right instead of doing something that's going to cause you know bigger unintended consequences and bigger problems down the road? Great, thanks, Nick. Um, <clears throat> what, how can we influence these efforts in privately owned shopping centers, which is the bulk of suburban restaurant locations? So with a lot of what we've done here in Old Town, um, you know, we're seeing it happen in other areas where they are doing some of the kind of expanded outdoor capacity and they're getting some of the same opportunities as far as funding goes from the city to implement these changes. Um, I think one of the struggles and it's like, you know, basically it, it's kind of depends on your perspective, but some of these private shopping areas aren't as pedestrian friendly. They're off of really busy streets. They don't have the infrastructure. They don't have the sidewalk. Getting in there and enjoying that, that walkability is something we're really fortunate to have in Old Town. Um, but if you're reaching out to an audience who prefers to drive and then have really easy parking, well, then those guys have the advantage. Yeah, you know, I've, I've, I remember having a conversation um, with another Front Range community and, and they were interested in implementing an open streets event and their idea was to basically do this at a mall. Um, I think that there are some incredible opportunities with our with with shopping centers that are that are privately owned and maintained. Uh, maybe there's maybe there's there's public infrastructure that intersects with those. Um, I think that there's a lot of potential there. I think that in, in my mind, so much of our programming in Fort Collins has historically been about, you know, pushing the bicycle, pushing the bicycle and pushing it some more. And at this point in time, my big, you know, MO is don't beat people over the head with a bicycle. Let's figure out other ways to frame these types of projects. And yes, they're, you know, we're, we're kind of designing this with active modes of transportation at the at the at the very most fundamental ground layer but when we build up on top of it we're talking about um ways to engage the community we're talking about developing social capital connecting uh neighbors to businesses in their neighborhoods letting businesses kind of take take ownership of um of an event so that they can help to co-create along i think when we're talking about equity with uh, historically marginalized and typically under-resourced groups, and we talk about um, shifting power and allowing uh, allowing those groups to co-create solutions. I think we might be able to apply a similar lens to our private businesses to to 
with the idea of co-creation to allow them to come to the table and help develop a program and initiative in a way that's going to meet their goals. I think, Joe, you talked a, a bit about this too, um, trying to create goal, shared goals and shared vision. Um, you know, the city, the, in our perspective, may have the money to make that happen in, in some cases, but we need the community co to come along with us. And the, the most powerful way to do that is to allow them to co-create with you or in i guess if you want to push it even further to let them really design it all that you're there is from a you know a, a municipal staff perspective is to help support so a lot of people are interested in you know um with the inevitabilities of the change of season um specifically i'm interested in hearing a little bit more about plans for colder weather months and um for Jay, um, are you clearing snow from the uh, closed streets? General question for all and specific question for Jay. Uh, yeah, I could uh, handle that uh, both actually just to start off. So for the, the T-Rex program, uh, yes, for all of our residential snow plow streets, um, we're deploying the smaller plows to go ahead and actually plow those. Uh, that of course, uh, our program, we only plow residential streets when it's uh, close or above four inches, and so that's not going to cover all of the locations. Uh, and then for some of our other locations that are on key important snow routes, um, we're working through ultimately what that will look like. Uh, right now, we've had two snow events, and both times we actually went out and removed the barricades uh, and, and actually provided a safe passage for the snow plows to get through. And then as soon as the weather warmed up and we had bare pavement, we put them out. Uh, all, we are currently looking at uh, implementing that kind of 2.0 design that will incorporate the ability to plow snow around it. So we don't have to do that issue and we're hoping to maybe have that in place on a few locations here in a few weeks. And then um, I'll just say I didn't present on it, um, but I've participated uh, quite a bit in, in Denver's program um, that Joe was kind of showing in Arvada. Uh, we have permitted the um, actual restaurants to keep their outdoor patios, uh, the temporary versions actually up until October of next year. And so snow plowing will occur uh, as typical on these streets. And then for the locations where they expanded, the property owners uh, are actually responsible for plowing the snow. Um, but I'm happy to say that uh, we do have a couple grants open right now, uh, both locally and then the state also has one for businesses to uh, get reimbursed for heaters and tents and things like that, just to help them actually kind of make it through winter and get people to come in addition to just worrying about clearing snow and all of that logistics stuff. Yeah, I'll second um, kind of what Jay was talking about there. We're, we're starting to really see it um, transform down here in Old Town. Um, our streets crew has been great about coming in and, and plowing within the street closure. And even before that, I mean, they had to come in and, and do leaf removal because uh, with street sweepers, because we were just so, so many leaves were piling up in the street. Um, so yeah, businesses are starting to take advantage of some of these grant opportunities um, through winterization grants. And, and you're seeing fire pits and you're seeing uh, some tents come up. Uh, one of my favorites is a restaurant called The Schoolhouse, went out and bought a school bus and then changed that into kind of an outdoor dining room. Um, so they're, they're getting creative out there and, and we're doing our best to kind of support them and, and steer them toward resources. And then of course there's the, the navigating of, okay, I want to put a giant tent up. How do I heat it? What can I do with propane heaters and all of that stuff? And so just looking to have that streamlined with the you know building department and fire department and, and all those people who need to sign off on it. Yeah, I also didn't um, you know talk at all about what we're doing in our downtown area. Um, I, I'm just not that involved with the with the project. I can tell you that we are also looking at extending um, our permits at least until the first of the year. Probably it wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me if we push that into into next spring or maybe even into next summer as well because it's been really well received. I can tell you that much. Um, from a, a winter programming standpoint, you know we're we generally use the winter as a time for. Um, uh, an event we call Light Up the Night, where we distribute free bike lights to community members in need. 
Uh, so we just we just had our first our first light of the, the night event uh, last week, and I think we've got two more scheduled. Um, winter bike to work day. We we historically uh, do our winter bike to work day in December rather than in February. But even this year, I think we'll probably um, skip that just because of the way that we typically do that event involves a lot of. I mean, it's a very public facing event. It involves people, you know, congregating, you know, outside, granted, but congregating in in um, you know, relatively small places. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll kind of leave leave my answer at that. Okay. Um, yeah. While we're talking about looking forward, um, is this experience changing any thoughts about long-term capital improvement planning in in your city? Um, question for all. I would say, yeah. I mean, um, I don't. I, we're so early on in, in in what does our open streets program look like, and how do we get to that point where that program is influencing our permanent infrastructure. Um, but we've also had some key changes in some of our other uh, in some of our other departments. Um, I think that with those changes, albeit losses for our organization, I think will allow us an opportunity um, to th to think about things that maybe we had thought about before, but in a different light. So uh, I think that there's so much potential for our long term um, for our long term infrastructure projects. I mean, bike and ped. If, if we want to talk about other capital improvement projects, we certainly can too. Um, so, so I, I, I want to get to that point where Open Streets is informing our bike ped projects and and the design there. I think we have, you know, spun our wheels in many cases where we've got you know 30% designs for a given for a given corridor, and then we send them back to the you know to the the um, the firm to have them redone and redone again, and then they sit there for a year and we pick it back up and do it again. I mean, I think this is just kind of a vicious cycle that we can. I think we can get out of, and I think we can get out of it if we are taking the opportunity to rethink what our engagement and outreach strategies look like. Um, I kind of mentioned it before, but I think this has been an experience if we're going to like silver line this one to say like, wow, we never thought that this would be possible, um, uh, let alone as successful as it's been and well received. Um, you know, we did have some businesses who were really, really concerned in the beginning of it um, around being in the street closure and how that was going to affect, you know, um, their customer base and, and, you know, what was more important to have that drive by traffic or to have that foot traffic. Right. Um, and so but really a lot of those concerns, I think, have been put to rest, um, obviously, from the bid perspective. Uh, we would totally be relying upon the city of Arvada and, and some of the other partner organizations to say like, okay, this is how we can launch this, right? And I think, you know, like Nick mentioned, we are just so much at the beginning of this to explore how, you know, do, do permanent street closures become a feature of Old Town? Like we know the business community kind of wants it now. We know the, the general community seems supportive of it up to this point. Um, of course, we still have to navigate a whole winter to see if it's going to be seasonal or, you know, year round. Um, but with that in mind, you know, what else would we have to address uh, around emergency access routes, around uh, code upgrades for the buildings, um, you know, is the area that we have closed now the area that we want closed or can we do it in a way where you know perhaps we turn some streets into one ways and then include um you know the other side of the block where they're not included now so there, there's a lot of considerations going into it but i think the exciting part is is that there seems to be a real desire for that conversation now where before it would have probably been you know pushing the boulder up the hill to get there Uh, and, and I'll say at Denver, you know, it's, it's probably too early to really know how capital investment is going to shake out, especially with the next few years, maybe in a little dicey on uh, city budgets. Um, but just, you know, thought processes and, and, and people considering things to what the other two had talked about. I think that's first and foremost um, what we're experiencing now and I hope does lead to more long term effects that so we can get capital behind them. Um, the ability to just try things, uh, put temporary materials out in the street. 
um, really talking to kind of what these guys were talking about, you know, Denver is in the process of implementing 125 miles of new bike lanes. Um, sorry, not bike lanes, bike facilities. So that includes a variety of different elements and treatments. Um, and now there's a lot of consideration on, you know, how do we kind of connect, you know, this T-Rex program to that, you know, if a street that is going to be turned into a neighborhood bikeway, you know, can we kind of do a temporary version of that? to test out the design, get the neighborhood a little bit more familiar with it, and then ultimately have a better product when the permanent rolls around. And, and I think, you know, we're, we're opening up to kind of more thought processes around that and really just rethinking the right away as a whole. Um, it does not just only need to be for vehicles, both moving and parking, um, you know, it can actually really help our economy and, and just the quality of life and vibrancy of our downtowns and other corridors. Uh, as we've seen in Arvada and other locations. And so, yes, I do think uh, it's going to change quite a bit. It's not necessarily how do we get back to normal. It's kind of what the new normal needs to be. And then we'll just have to probably wait a little bit until the actual capital dollars follow that thought process. I, I couldn't have said it better, Jay, The your point that we're not talking about how do we get back to normal, but what does the new normal look like? And I think that's something that's really, really exciting to consider. Excellent. Um, I have one more question and then I'm going to open it up for parting thoughts and wrap us up. Um, the last question that has come in is, have you all three had discussions about involving seniors in these events and changes? Uh, yeah, with our Open Streets program, um, engaging seniors is certainly important to us. We've pursued, um, we pursue, pursued some external funding specifically for intergenerational programming at Open Streets. Um, that was before COVID happened, so we were in the midst of, of submitting that application, and then COVID happened and, and kind of threw us, you know, threw us into a completely different scenario. Um, but yes, I mean, when my background is in public health, and so when we talk about transportation systems, um, and, and especially as we've been talking about engaging from an equity perspective, engaging our historically marginalized and upper, upper underrepresented communities. It behooves us not just to think about people who um, who have di who have differences in terms of racial and ethnic demographics, but also in terms of age and where they lived and what their lived experiences. I think it's incredibly important that yeah, we get to a point where we've got seniors and youth and people of color that bridge all of those gaps. We've got people that are coming from upper middle class, and we have people who are maybe even experiencing homelessness that are a part of all of this, because from a municipal standpoint, that's what we strive to do is to deliver equitable services. So yes, I think it's important that, that, we, we, do, that we do engage with our seniors and other populations. Um, I think we've seen some pretty great uh, response from that so far. I remember one of our, I think our very first Open Streets event uh, of the participants we sampled, I think our age range was from you know, zero or, or three, three years old or something like that, all the way up until like 99 years old. So that's just one data point to indicate that there is a potential here. And I think that when we're talking about such a, a great proportion of our communities that are aging and the importance of aging in place and importance of maintaining healthy quality years of life, um, they've got to be at the table when we're making those decisions. Um, uh, I think I, oh, sorry, you want to go, Jay, go for it. Yeah, mine's going to be pretty quick. Uh, you know, we, we considered everyone, you know, for, for our plans, both um, for business expansion and then also for the T-Rex program. They, they were designed with safety in mind, first and foremost, and so that uh, means they need to be comfortable um, and really accessible for anyone, you know, age one to 99. And so naturally that included uh, the older uh, populations of Denver. And so we didn't necessarily deliberately uh, reach out or consider them. It was just kind of baked into the process. Yeah, I, I kind of jumped into it a little bit because that was a concern that we were hearing from the community initially. Um, and I think we continue to, you know, consider it and try to address it. Obviously, if a street's close to parking and you used to park in front of your favorite business, you can't do that anymore. But how can we get you close enough and how can we make sure that you're not walking blocks on end? And so we've done some things around, hey, if you're just coming down to, you know, 
pick up a cake from your favorite bakery, awesome, here's a loading zone that you can definitely use that gets you closer. So we try to be strategic around where we put loading zones. Um, the, the big thing that we've always struggled to communicate here in Old Town is there is an abundance of parking options. Your only option is not just parking on the street. We have public lots, it's free parking. We have a whole parking garage, right? Um, but I think, you know, we'll continue, like I said, with the um, valet program and some of these things to continue to address it and keep it uh, top of mind. Awesome. Thank you all. Uh, we're at time, so I wanted to um, express gratitude to um, Jay, Nick, and Joe for speaking today and everybody for attending. Um, just a reminder that there will be a survey that pops up upon exiting the webinar. Um, please consider taking a couple minutes to complete that. It helps us um, know, you know what direction to go with, with these um, idea exchanges. Um, contact information on the screen. Love to keep this conversation going. Thanks again. Have a great day.